Thanks for tuning in to The Ordinary Filmmaker. Subscribe to get notification of new videos like this one so you don't miss any news, rumors, gear reviews, or tutorials. And a big thanks to Atomos for sponsoring The Ordinary Filmmaker. I'm using the Ninja 5 external recorder for all my studio work as it saves me a ton of time in post. So if you want to speed up your projects in post, use my links down below to purchase your own Ninja. And it also helps support this channel. And now for a recap of this week's news. If you want a full news breakdown, watch the videos indicated by the picture in picture here. It certainly has been a busy week. We got word that Canon's working on a 100 plus megapixel camera to be announced later this year and available for sale sometime in 2022. Then on Monday, we got word that Sony's also working on a 100 plus megapixel camera. It looks like the competition between these two isn't going anywhere soon and that's a great thing for all of us. Then on Tuesday, Canon announced firmware, the much anticipated firmware 1.3 for their flagship camera, the 1DX Mark III, the Canon R6, and the Canon EOS R5. Now the R5 got the bulk of the updates, including Canon Log3, but the R6 got a little extra surprise. When shooting in 120 or 100 frames per second in cropped mode, well, the R6 would just go ahead and shut down on you and become unresponsive for a little while. Yeah, that was a nice little treat. Two days later, Canon issued firmware 1.3.1 to fix this issue. Now, my recommendation is if you haven't upgraded to 1.3 yet, let's wait a few more weeks. And if you have, go ahead and put 1.3.1 on there. Now, this has got to be the fastest turnaround from Canon that I've ever seen. I guess the testing program wasn't as broad or in-depth this time around. In an interview with DP Review, Panasonic's Yamani-san said that they'll continue to improve upon their DFD autofocus system. So customers looking for well, Panasonic to finally move off phase detect, or sorry, move to phase detect, will have to wait a little longer and consider their options. OM Digital surprised the market with a quad and dual pixel autofocus patent. Could this be in their WOW camera? Now, the more I hear about OM Digital, the more I want to climb onto their bandwagon. The WOW camera is starting to intrigue me. I wonder what they have cooked up. Hopefully, we'll get a leak soon. I've finally been able to source the Ordinary Filmmaker baseball cap. It's $34.99 and can be ordered from OrdinaryFilmmaker.com and does ship worldwide. Now we've made 50 caps for the first run. Get yours while they're available. Like staying informed and learning about camera gear? Subscribe and choose all notifications to get notified as soon as I publish a video. But now it's time to answer your questions. Got a question for next week's video? Post it in the questions down below. Sorry, post it in the comment section down below and I might be answering your question next week. And now for our first question. Joseph asks, when will a Canon EOS R Mark II be coming out? Joseph, this has to be the most asked question I get on this channel. There really isn't going to be a direct EOS R Mark II. The EOS R and the RP were more or less one-off cameras. And I'm going to answer the question you didn't ask. What about the EOS RP? Well, Canon is going to be doing what I would call a successor to the EOS RP, uh, but it isn't going to be the EOS RP Mark II. What Canon's got planned is a entry level, a low cost entry level full frame mirrorless camera on the R system and it's likely going to start at $899. Uh, most likely they'll do what they did with the, the M6, they'll remove an EVF and have it as an option to help keep prices down. The Canon R6 is essentially a successor to the EOS R but it's a much higher priced camera. The EOS R6 is more or less a successor to the R6. And price wise, it's about the same price as when the EOS R first came out. However, Canon does have a plan for another camera that's going to sit between the EOS RP, the new one coming out, and the current Canon R6. So it's going to be mid priced and midway capable. So it's not going to have the same video and still specs as the R6, but it's going to be you know, priced. So we got $2,500 for the R6, $899. It's probably going to be priced in and around. I know $17.99, somewhere around there. This camera and the RP were supposed to be announced uh, late last year and available for sale in the first half of this year, but because of everything, um, that's not happening. Canon's really had difficulty sourcing parts and getting cameras produced. Um, the R5 is only starting to catch up and it was released in July last year. So it, it's really anyone's guess as to when these cameras will be coming out, but I would expect hopefully I mean, we're already in April now. I would expect by May, June at the latest, we would have some sort of announcement or leak letting us know what's going to happen with these cameras. But I got to be honest with you, uh, a lot of the announcements I was expecting to get this year 
haven't happened. And uh, the, the primary reason for that is just simply Canon has not been able to keep up with production. They've got numerous issues from sourcing parts to production issues. And um, I wish I could give you something a little bit more concrete, but we're just going to have to wait and see. But there is going to be another product that's going to be between the EOS RP and the R6. And that might be the camera that you might be looking for. Core asks, will the R6 get C-Log2 or C-Log3? Yes, yes it is. It's going to be coming to the R6 in a future firmware update. It's also going to be coming to the 1DX Mark III in a future firmware update. It's just the R5 got all the love this time. Although again, once again, the R6 did get something a little extra. Yay. Douglas asks, is there any new information on whether we'll get a photocentric version of the Panasonic GH6? I think you're probably referring to the news that I put out in May of 2020. It was rumored back then that we were going to get the GH6 later that year, and, but we were also going to get a photocentric and a videocentric version. The videocentric version was going to be called the GH6V, and the photocentric version, the, GH, the GH6X. Nothing, absolutely nothing has been dropped or leaked or mentioned since then, so it's really hard to say. We've had very little actually from Panasonic on the direction. It's pretty safe to say that they're going to come out with a GH6 very similar to the GH5 in terms of its market segmentation. It's going to be primarily a video-centric camera with lots of good photo features as well. Uh, but what they did with the GH5 is they announced the GH5S, which was far more focused on video. So either way, I expect we'll get at least two cameras, a video-centric version and the GH6. Now, whether we get a photo-centric version, that's anyone's guess. Um, Anybody who's kind of interested in the GH series right now, I mean, we're all video people, right? So I don't know if there's much demand for a photocentric version. And you've got to look at Panasonic's sales numbers. Uh, worldwide, they're less than 5%. 5%, less than 5% of worldwide sales. So do they have enough R&D budget to come out three separate versions of the GH6? I don't know. I, I could, Right now, on launch, whenever that is, it could be this year, I'd expect them to come out with the GH6 and that's it. And then if sales do well, they might come out with a GH6S, a GH6V or X. It's really hard to tell. This is a very tough year to forecast because we're dealing with variables that we haven't dealt with in pretty much 100 years. So as soon as I know, I'll let you know. But sadly, we haven't heard anything since May of last year. The rest is more or less conjecture. Vasco asks, can Canon's lenses resolve the detail for 100 megapixels? I'd love to see Canon make a medium format sensor and a new body and lens lineup to go with it. That would be awesome. Well, Canon's more or less already said that they're not going to even bother looking at medium format. And it looks like, from what we're seeing right now, not only Canon, but Sony's also coming out with a sensor that can easily support 100 megapixels. Now, let's take a look at the current lenses that Canon has. The RF platform is pretty detailed. Um, if you look at certain lenses, and let's, we're going to go look at the more expensive lenses, the ones that people say are far too expensive, like the 50mm f1.2, or one of my favorites is the 28-70mm. to 70 millimeter. Now, this lens here, uh, when it first came out, I believe it was only available for the EOS R because the EOS R was the only camera out at the time. Um, and let's not even mention the RP, but the EOS R... Um, didn't have nearly enough detail in the sensor to be able to take full advantage of that lens. That lens is so sharp that even the R5 um, isn't detailed enough to take full advantage of it. And I think lenses like that can easily provide an, a huge amount of detail. So I don't think there's a problem with the, the R system itself. I think the architecture of the R system uh, allows lenses to capture more than enough detail. The bottleneck that I would be concerned with is the sensor itself. Is the sensor good enough? Is the sensor architected well enough? Is it large enough to be able to capture all the detail that the lens is sending it? That's the question that I would have. So I really don't think you necessarily need to come out with new lenses for, or sorry, a new lens platform for, uh, and come out with a medium format system. I think it's just a matter of developing a very good sensor that can really take advantage of it. And the fact that Sony's also working on this, leads me to believe that maybe with current technology, we are able to produce really good, really detailed images on a full frame sensor. We'll just have to wait and see. And a second question from Core. When filming and editing in slow motion, how does it work? If you film at 120 frames per second and put it into a 24 or 30 frames per second timeline, can you adjust the playback speed of the 120 frames per second clip? For example, can you film in 120 frames per second 
and start it off at regular speed only to slow down the part that you want and then speed up to normal speed. Yes, Corey, you can. Now, um, I don't shoot 120 frames per second an awful lot, but when I do, it's always in 4K, and I just love the level of detail. Uh, now, what I tend to do is I'm always focusing on a subject, so I generally blur out the background. And I did a little test not too long ago where I filmed in 4K at 120 frames per second. I brought it into my timeline, and I pretty well always always set the timeline to 30 frames per second. So what that gives you at 120 divided by four is four times slow motion. As you can see here, it's buttery smooth. But if I wanna speed things up, and I'm just gonna do a simple test here. I'm not gonna do the complex um, effort or the effect that you want here, but let's go ahead and speed it up to two times. I'll set it to two times the speed. And you can see that it's not as slow. And I can adjust it to four times the speed. And guess what? We're back at regular motion. Now, obviously, with special effects, you can take it and you can have it go at normal speed and then use a really nice transition to slow it right down like somebody's running into glue. So, yeah, you do have full flexibility. Now, I'm using the, um, uh, losing my words here, I'm using Final Cut Pro, and this was a pretty simple thing to do. Um, I'm sure you can do this with uh, DaVinci Resolve and Adobe Premiere as well. Okay, I don't know who loaded all these questions on here, but it seems to be this is Core's question and answer week. Our last question from Core is, can you explain the difference between a J-cut and L-cut when editing video, and are there certain situations where one is better than the other? Well, Core, you've already reached your two-question limit, so I'm going to have to pass this over to Moving Matt to get you your answer. Thanks, Tom. Hey everyone, welcome to Moving Matt, and thank you all for having me back. So today I get to answer a super cool question, and that is about what is the difference between J and L cuts, and if there's a situation where one is better than the other. So J and L cuts are very simple but effective types of transitions that you have 100% seen before, and maybe even used in your videos, but maybe didn't know what they were and how they got their name. The simplest way to help you understand J and L cuts is to simply show you them in action. So there you go, I just did them. <laughs> so the L cut was when my audio continued from the first scene, AKA me talking, into the next scene. And then the J cut happened when the audio picked up on me talking before you saw me. I know that was super simple, but that's kind of the point of J and L cuts. It allows you to move into a scene or the next part of the story very seamlessly. They are used literally all the time in movies, commercials, and YouTube videos, and you probably never noticed, which again is kind of the point. Okay, so now that you know what they are, why are they called J and L cuts? Well, they get their name simply by the look in a timeline of most NLEs. For example, this is how it looks in Final Cut Pro. Notice the way that the video of the first clip overlaps with the audio from the second clip, forming the shape of a J. And then when the video from the second clip overlaps with the audio from the first clip, it looks like an L. Now I know what you're thinking, and that is that it looks like an L and a backwards L, but I guess that doesn't roll off the tongue quite as easy. Now these type of cuts are used all the time when it comes to conversations, but it isn't exactly easy when it's just, wait, you know, actually, can you, can you help me? Oh, me? Yeah, you. <laughs> Wow, um, I don't, I don't know what to say. Uh, you've, you've never, you never called on me before. Uh, I guess uh, I just had like to say uh, how much of an honor it is to, you know, talk to you. And hi, uh, I don't really know what to do with my hands. Um, you know what? Actually, just, just stop. You're, you're messing it up. Okay, so where was I? I was. I was uh, just uh, then finish, finish fast. What, what are you wanting to say? I was just gonna say that you know maybe people should go to Moving Matt and consider subscribing. And that is how you use J and L cuts and shamelessly plug at the same time. Now to quickly address if there are certain situations where one is better than another, it's really always gonna be story driven. If you feel like one dialogue or audio from one scene will work well flowing into the next or vice versa, it's really gonna depend on what feels right to you. Sometimes a J cut can make something kind of feel hurried along and an L cut can kind of make something feel like it's dragging out, but that's really just a general rule and there's plenty exceptions to it. So try not to get wrapped up on which one you should use in any given situation. There's a reason why filmmaking is still considered an art. But I hope this has been helpful and maybe entertaining. Thanks again for everyone for allowing me to come back and until next time, back to you, Tom. Thanks a lot, Jen. Now, in all seriousness, thank you uh, for helping us out with this question, Moving Matt. Um, guys, look, uh, Moving Matt's been doing a terrific job of helping us out on the channel here. Go over and visit his channel, subscribe and like, 
And uh, you might like his Camera Wars segment, which comes out on a weekly basis. He does a really good job there, and he's got some very useful insight. And now, for our next question. Rumor has it asks, are you hanging off for the A1X or M2 MacBooks before buying, given the current M1 only supports two Thunderbolt channels? Well, the first thing I want to clarify here is the, the processor is actually called the M1 processor, so it's probably going to be called the M1X or the M2. But yes, I am waiting. And the reason why I'm waiting is uh, I just sold my iMac Pro. And the reason I did that is Apple's doing an architecture shift. And it's a huge architecture shift. So anything from the old architecture isn't going to garner as much money on the resale market. So I sold mine while the value was still good. I got about $3,000 US for it. And that's a good bit of money that should be able to buy, allow me to go out there and buy a MacBook Pro. Now, I'm not completely sold on getting a MacBook Pro. I want to see what the new iMacs are like. Um, the, the type of machine I want it usually has 32 gigabytes of memory. It needs to be very, very fast. And I want really good GPU support. So I'm waiting to see what Apple comes out with on a MacBook Pro or an iMac. Now, based on what I've seen with these guys here, this is an M1 MacBook Air, I'm pretty impressed with the speed of it. Now, it's not nearly as fast as I would like it to be for my heavy workloads, working with 8K and 4K video, but I'm really curious to see what Apple does here. Uh, I'm, and as far as speculation goes, I really don't know. I, I don't know what the for performance is going to be like, but considering how they're able to produce really incredible performance on these units here, I do expect them to exceed my expectations. Now, let's say that they don't. Let's say that these things are overpriced, the ports are terrible, um, and they just don't perform well. Well, then I'll consider going back out to the market and buying another used iMac Pro, and hopefully for a lower price. I'm not going to dump a whole bunch of money on a, on a MacBook Air, or sorry, a MacBook Pro or an iMac if it doesn't deliver what I need. But I'm, I'm sensing that the screens for the iMacs, the screens are going to be super detailed really, really impressive in terms of resolution and color and gamut and all that wonderful stuff. And on the performance wise, I expect the performance to be really good too. So I'm waiting to see what they come up with. I'm kind of open right now. I do like the idea of being mobile with a MacBook Pro because I can move anywhere in my house. Editing in the basement in the wintertime, it makes it awfully cold down here. So um, we'll just have to wait and see, but it's a really good question. I'm, I'm, the rumors coming out on Apple Insider, they're nice. They indicate that something's going to come out most likely we're going to know at WWDC 2021, which I believe is around June the 7th to June the 11th. And right then and there, they're probably going to announce the iMacs and the MacBook Pros, and some of them might be available for sale within a week. But I expect that the MacBook Pros might not be available for sale until later the summer, just in time for the back-to-school season. So, yes, I am eagerly awaiting. I do edit some of my videos on the um, M1 MacBook Air, but I don't want to... I don't want to beat this thing to death because it only has eight gigabytes of RAM. It wasn't built for video editing. And so what it's going to do is it's going to start throttling the SSD and wearing it down. And I really don't want to do that. This is really designed as a family computer. I bought it as a family computer for my son to help him with his um, Google Classroom work, for his homework, for me uh, browsing the internet, um, you know, that sort of thing. It is not designed. And yes, I could have got 16 gigs, but I don't see the point of buying something fully expanded and not use those capabilities. I'm just throwing good money away. And so this was a pretty good value. I think it was around $1,200 US. The one thing I did beef up on it, I got 512 gigabytes. Um, 256 today just isn't enough. Uh, and this is small enough that this can be our travel computer as well. So if I'm out there shooting a lot of 4K video, and I want to provide redundancy, all I do is when I get back to the hotel at night is I take the video off the R5 and I can load it onto this thing here. So that will hold quite a bit of video as well, giving me a little bit of redundancy, but really good question. Thank you, Tom. Man Friendly Church asks, does it matter if I choose NTSC or PAL in my camera settings as they're analog options and I shoot digital? Now, if we were in 1987, 1988, and I had my video toaster, then yes, this would make an awful lot of difference because pretty well all the TVs back then were set to 60 hertz in North America and 50 hertz in Europe under the PAL. And if I went ahead and produced something for PAL, then anybody who had a television set wouldn't be able to watch it and only multi-sync monitors would be able to handle the signal. Well, flash forward to today, we really don't have that same problem. Uh, your monitor is going to be able to look at NTSC or PAL. It doesn't really matter. Now, where it does matter an awful lot, is if you're going to be producing content for the broadcast industry. They are very, very detailed on what their specifications are. 
So if you're going to produce something for a TV channel in the UK, well, you have to follow their PAL standards. Same thing here in North America. But for YouTube, it's a different story. Now, I do set my camera to NTSC because, well, I live in North America and that's the standard for North America. I'm not aware of any issues, but I just don't want to open up myself to any issues. So what does that mean? Well, your resolutions and frame rates can differ, especially in the early days, there was definite differences between the frame rates. But if you're doing 4K or UHD now, well, your resolution is the same in both systems. But the refresh rates are a little different, or the frequency, or the frame rates. So if I set my camera to NTSC, I have the following choices. 24, 30, 60, and 120 frames per second. If I set it to PAL, I have different options. I have 25, I have 50, and I have 100 frames per second. And they're nice and even. It's not as, NTSC has, you, you don't really get 24 frames per second, it's actually 23.97. And the same with 30, it's actually 29.97. And 50 is actually, I think, 59.6 something. And 120 is 119 point something. And that's to bury, I th what is it? I remember, it's been a while since I've looked at this, but it's, it's, it's about being compatible with the older system and you've got the audio buried in with the video, so they need to make a little bit of room, something like that. I, I'm not saying I said that right, because normally for this type of question, I'll do a little bit of research ahead of time, but I wasn't planning on get, going into a deep dive. So for you producing content, if you're uploading it to YouTube, well, it doesn't really matter. See, you're watching this video now, I produced this video at 4K, so it's 3840 by 2160, and I shot it at 30 frames per second, which is actually 29.9 something. And you're watching it in the UK, and you're not having any problems, are you? Right? So if you're uploading your content to YouTube, and let's say you want to get 20, 120 frames per second, then feel free to set your camera to NTSC, and you can open up that higher frame rate. You know, it, it's, there, there's very few restrictions today doing digital, but again, it, it's based on your use case. Are you doing this for YouTube? Yeah, no problem. But if you want some of your work, or you're producing some work for a client and they need to follow broadcast standards, well, then you need to follow that PAL NTSC. And there are different PAL standards around the world too. There's not just PAL Europe, there's other different PALs and they have slightly different uh, specifications. But that's it for now. That's the end of this week's questions. I do want to talk about a couple of things in behind the scenes. First of all, I want to wish a happy Easter to everybody that follows Easter. We have a nice four day long weekend here and I'm taking off next week too. Don't worry, I'll still be producing content, but I'm going to be more relaxed as I am here today. This has to be one of the shortest Q&A videos or AMA videos I've done in a long time. And the reason is, well, I want to enjoy the weekend with my family, so the questions are a little bit light, they're a little bit short, because it's Easter, it's beautiful, it's sunny outside, it is cold right now, believe it or not, the temperature is actually minus one, no, it's not, it's minus four centigrade, can you believe that? Minus four, that's about 26 Fahrenheit, I just can't believe that. Now, tomorrow it's supposed to go up to 15 degrees Celsius, or about, what, 60? I Somewhere between about 50 and 70, um, I have trouble converting because when I was a child, I lived in New Zealand and the system we used back then was Imperial, Fahrenheit. You know, there was five liters to the gallon, that kind of thing. But somehow, when I got on a plane and left New Zealand and went over to England, the whole planet started converting over to metric. And so by the time I landed in Canada in 79, the system had just converted over to metric, so I was learning metric, and guess what? It was November, November the 2nd at 2 p.m., and it was amazing. <laughs> the temperatures were cold, and everyone's talking in Celsius. So I learned to associate Celsius with winter temperatures and Fahrenheit with summer temperatures, and especially in Canada, for about 10 years or so after that, a lot of weather channels were talking about both, so I very quickly learned to associate Fahrenheit with summer temperatures and Celsius with winter temperatures. That's just a me thing. So every now and then I will just mention one or the other, but most often I try to give you both uh, systems. Now the next thing I want to talk to you about is the spring challenge. Um, thank you so much. We had over 18 entries this time around. 
I narrowed it down to five and we have five entries. That's Dominic, One Shot, Branson M, Brandon Charles, and Dean Adley. And these, right now, these final five contestants are in a poll on my community page right here. So please go ahead and watch the videos and go ahead and give your vote because what's happening right now is it turns out to be a little bit, as One Shot said, it turns out to be a little bit about who has more friends right now. And look, I've got 22,000 subscribers. Um, and at least 10% of you are watching right now. Go take a look at vote and let's try to bring a little bit more of who's got the best video than who has the most friends here. This poll isn't going to close until Friday. There's some really, really stunning entries. Trust me, you, you, you start watching these and you're going to want to rewatch some of these. So please, please support your community and vote. And let's see if we can't have a winner right now. I think we've got about 120 votes in. So that's pretty exciting. One other thing I want to talk to you about, this hat is now available for sale on The Ordinary Filmmaker. You can get it for $34.99, and it's part of my strategy to help engage you guys more. OrdinaryFilmmaker.com was started about a month ago, and there was really only one thing you could do on there, and that's sign up to get notifications. Now, some of you said, well, Simon, I already get notifications from YouTube, and that's fine. I'm not trying to take that option away from you. The reason I did this is I got an awful lot of complaints. I got more complaints about this that I'm going to tell you in a second than people asking about EOS R Mark II. And the complaint was is I didn't get a notification or the notification came in late. So what I'm finding is the service I've set up, it generally you'll get the notification within one minute. So if you like to say first all the time, sign up and you'll probably get notified long before it YouTube notifies you, or you can test it out, see which is better. But that was the first step. That was an easy win just to get the site out there, to get the branding set up, because that in itself is a big activity. So the next part is to launch merch. And the hat is the first part about doing that. Then I'm going to do other things such as shirts, uh, hoodies, t-shirts. And my goal with the merchandise is to provide you what I consider quality products. You spend good money on cameras. I'm not about to sell you really cheap or gear aimed at just 18 and 19 year olds. And I, I have plenty of 18 or 19 year olds on my channel, but I want to provide you with gear that you would expect to wear as a photographer, as a videographer. So that's the second stage of this strategy, the strategy to engage you more. But more is coming. I've got lots planned and I'm not going to let you in on everything right now, but um, there is going to be an April or May challenge coming up where I'm going to be giving away a Weeble S. And it's going to be another video challenge. You're going to create a video of 30 seconds or more. And I haven't worked out all the details yet, but um, this one's going to be a little bit interesting. So this time around, again, I'm going to come up and narrow down the top five contestants. But then I'm going to have a judge, and he's going to pick the top entry. And he's going to give a brief little answer as to why he thinks it's the entry. And guess who this person's going to be? It's going to be Jordan Drake from DP Review. So that's going to be really exciting. He's going to help me out with that. And I, 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 I first thought of Jordan because Jordan's very good at video. He eats, he lives, he sleeps video. And I think he'd be the perfect person to kind of look at these videos. He, under, he can look at a video and go, I understand what it took to create this. Uh, a lot of times, like if you're looking at One Shot or Dominic, and you see how smooth their video is. Uh, as a stills photography, well, you just expect that. But as a videographer, you look at that and you understand what it took to get there. You know if it's using IBIS. You know if it's using some sort of stabilizer or gimbal. And so that's why I reached out to Jordan. So that's one, one thing coming up. There's other things, too, that I want to help engage you more into the channel to help build a more solid community. And the goal is to get this channel up to 100,000 subscribers within a year. And so we'll see if that happens. If not... Well, I'm still going to have fun along the way, and I'm not going to monetize this channel, try to get you guys to buy hats. Also, if you want to buy a hat, feel free to do so, but don't feel pressured into having to do so. It's the same with my affiliate links. I really do appreciate when you use my affiliate links down below because I get 2% of the sale and it goes into supporting the channel, but I don't, I don't bug you day in and day out in every video. Please use my affiliate links. It's up to you if you want to do that. If you have a great little camera store in your own town, Please support them. Um, I love supporting small businesses. But if you are going to buy from BNH, if you are going to buy from Amazon, well, then it doesn't hurt you to use my links because there's no markup at all. You just use my link to go to BNH or Amazon, and once you complete a sale, I get a small commission there. So uh, that, that, the, 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 big, the whole point of me starting this channel way back when was 
to learn more, to have fun doing it, to instead of spending my time binge watching on YouTube or, or Netflix or Amazon Prime, it was a way to get me doing something active to keep my mind working. And it certainly has done that. I've spent an awful lot of time doing these videos. I am so busy a lot of the time. And sometimes like this week here, I, I kind of think like, oh, I wish I wasn't doing this. But that's normal. Whenever you get busy, sometimes you always second guess. The amount of times I've thought of canceling the channel, let me tell you, it, it, it's up there. But when you can produce something rewarding and when you see that people appreciate what you do, it keeps you going because, you know, if I stop doing this, what am I going to do? Go back to binge watching Netflix and all that kind of stuff? No. I think part of what I've learned to do is balance things a little bit more. Is when things are a little bit busy, sure, maybe I can put off this video till tomorrow. I'm still going to go out for a walk with my family, feed the geese, that kind of thing. But uh, I really do appreciate you watching my channel, voting, participating, engaging. Um, it, it's For me, uh, it's very rewarding. So thanks a lot. But that's it for now. Thanks so much for watching The Ordinary Filmmaker. Don't forget to subscribe for your chance to win two Angelbird 128GB AV Pro MK2 V90 SD cards along with an Angelbird UHS-2 dual SD card reader. Or you could also win a Ulanzi LED light package with accent lights, an underwater light, and various flat panel lights you can use for lighting your subject or for starting your own YouTube channel. And then I'll be offering up other price bundles all the way up to 100000 at which point I'll be giving away a brand new Canon EOS R5 full-frame mirrorless camera to one lucky viewer. And on that bombshell, thanks so much for watching The Ordinary Filmmaker. Have yourself a happy and safe Easter, and we'll see you again soon.